Okay, so hello everyone. Welcome to PMFIS Current Affair Test Series. My name is Ashish Malik and this is your test number 7, part 4. And in this particular video, we will be discussing the next 20 questions that is from 61 to 80. So let us get started with the discussion and I really hope that you have enjoyed the previous parts. If you have not yet checked out the test series guys, it's high time that you should practice these 1000 high quality MCQs prepared by PMFIS. Don't forget to boost up your score with the test series which has everything that you need from the prelims perspective. So do check out our test series. It's available at just Rs 499. The link is available in the description below. Do not forget to check it out. Now coming to the question guys, the question number 61 which was asked is with respect to the Grid India. Absolute important topic and this has something to do uh, with the with what you say as a as a energy security of India. What is this grid India? What relation does it has with the power grid? So this is absolutely important topic given the present scenario. The lot of questions are coming with respect to the energy sector. So what we need to learn about the grid India first learn that why it was in news and why we have put it in the uh, test series because the seventh grid India day recently celebrated. And that makes the context why this particular thing is in the news. Second thing that you need to know about the Grid India. Grid India, what is exactly Grid, grid India? First understand that. Grid India is actually, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a PSU that we have. It's a central public sector enterprise. This PSU is entrusted with the crucial responsibility of ensuring the integrated operation of the electricity grid in a reliable, efficient and secure manner. It's not just important that you have the electricity available. Available electricity needs to be reliable, efficient and secure as well so that the power distribution can be done in a, in a proper, efficient manner. And initially this job was done by power grid along with other job as well. But then we realized that there has to be a dedicated mini, uh, PSU that can take care of this particular reliability, efficient and secure security of the electricity. And that's why in 2017, Grid India was separated from the power grid and now it has become another uh, central public sector enterprise overall functioning under Ministry of Power. If you remember this much, if you have this much knowledge, the question could have been solved very, very easily because that's exactly what they have asked. And given the factor, both statements are absolutely correct here. Now, Great India, of course, the ministry is still logical to think because grid is power grid. We know about the power grids, the electricity grids. So Great India makes every sense why it has to be Ministry of Power. But again, there is one factual information also along with the logic. Is it? It, uh, like has it got separated in 2017 this is pure fact that you need to either learn or take a risk on that because you can't you can't do any guesswork why why 2017 there is no logic behind it it's a fact that you need to remember was it separated from the power grid maybe because because see sometimes they can switch the statement they can say the power grid separated from the grid india the question can reverse the two things as well so again this first line has some logic involved but again, it has a lot of facts involved as well. Then the second statement is still something that you can, you can guess. And you can, you can uh, figure out by, by reading that statement, okay, if there is something called Grid India, okay, I can still understand, probably this could be the function of some kind of PSU. And uh, that makes still a little bit sense. So yes, the question was a medium level question, but was it very easy to attempt? No, it was not that easy to attempt blindly. If you have not uh, read about it, you can't, you really need not to skip it altogether. You can take a risk because you have, you have 70 to 80 percent logic involved with few facts that you can still play a little bit risky here. So uh, the answer has supposed to be C. Careful with the facts and always remember UPSC is going to trick you on, in one way or the other. The second, uh, the 62nd question was the one of the favorite topics of the UPSC, the governor and one of the favorite format of the question asking that is statement one, statement two, and then you have to figure out the relation between the two. Now the question is with respect to governor, his discretionary powers. 
So what's what's exactly is there? Let's first try to understand. We have read about governors n number of times, and especially in the present scenario, the present political setup of India, lots and lots of controversies and things are around the governor, their functioning, their role, their discretionary powers, and a lot of other things are there. Now, especially in, when it comes to discretionary power, discretionary power means where the uh, governor is not bound by the advice of the Council of Ministers. Usually, uh, as per the constitutional requirement, the governor is supposed to function as per the advice given by Council of Ministers. But there are some situations where governor has a power to take a decision on his own independently without depend depending on any of the Council of Ministers. And for that purpose, there are certain discretionary powers specified by the constitution itself. For example, if you go by article, and, and let me tell you, when I'm mentioning these articles, you never know, you may have a question where the articles are given and their subject matter in front of you and you are supposed to match the following. It's a, it's a very common kind of question that, that's been asked in the UPSC these days. Article 167 talks about seeking the information from the chief minister about the administrative and legislative matter. For that purpose, governor need not to take up advice from council of minister. That he can do on his own. Similarly, if as per article 200, if let's say there is a bill which is passed by the state legislature that comes to the governor for his uh, assent, in that purpose, if he feels purely his own will and his own understanding, if he thinks that you know there is a need to reserve the bill for the president consideration, he can do it independently without any involvement of the council of ministers. Similarly, when it comes to article 356, president rule, it is governor who can recommend to the president, okay, I think there is a requirement to impose the president rule and if governor is fully satisfied that there is a failure of constitutional machinery. Now in that particular case, he can, he can uh, give his, uh, uh, you know, advice to the president directly. One thing I would like to, uh, uh, you know, make sure that you understand one thing also here. Can president only impose president rule only after getting the advice from the governor? No. I mean, the president can do it on its own also. He or she need not to be dependent on the uh, governor advice. But usually the governor advice is seeked since governor knows more ground reality of that state, right? Also, the governor of a state is not bound to act on the aid and advice of the chief minister and council of minister while performing his duties as an administrator of the neighboring union territory in case he has got the additional charge. There is a provision. One governor can be governor of two states also. A same person can be appointed as a governor of a state and neighboring UT also. Now, if, if that additional charge is there, he or she is not bound to, uh, you know, take up the advice of the other state if he is acting towards the other union territory of the state, right? That, that also is a discretionary power of the gover governor. Similarly, the governor can appoint a chief minister when no party has a clear-cut majority and that he can do by his own discretionary power. When in the case there is a caretaker government can be appointed temporarily, that can also be done by... Uh, the governor on its own, governor can dismiss the council of minister when it can't prove the confidence of the state assembly. When, when if the council of minister lose the no confidence motion or uh, I mean the no confidence motion gets passed, of course it's up to the governor to dismiss the council of minister or not. He can dissolve the state assembly when the council, they lose the majority. So all of these functions are a part of discretionary power of the governor. Let me give you a star rating here. So it's a, it's a four star question. I think out of five that can be asked in your in your exam. So understand the level of the importance of this topic. Also, now this is one thing. Okay. Now, if you if you look at the question, the second statement, please understand, the elected government at the state level is not even consulted while making appointment to the governor. Statement two is correct. One is also correct. But do you see any relation to that? Because this is about the appointment of the governor. Statement 1 is about the discretionary power. The Both statements are correct. But are they interrelated? They are not. In this case, you see, first and second are correct, but they are not related. I mean, how, how statement number 2, when it comes to appointment of the, uh, of the governor, do you see any connection or a, any explanation towards the first one? No, the two things are very separate. How the governor is to be appointed, that's a one thing. 
what are the powers are, are separate things so answer has to be d i think this question this particular question was a very easy one it's a direct question from any standard polity book that you can attempt without any problem okay easily could have been attempted the answer is supposed to be b moving on to the next one which is question 63 one of the upsc favorite uh, in terms of match the following in terms of iucn status species this i would say you are definitely going to see at least one question coming on the species iucn status this is one favorite topic of the upsc and is going to be there for a long time you have the three species olive ridley ghadial and Al uh, alpine ibex and then in front of that you are supposed to uh, check out if the iucn status are correct or not do you have any logic behind it we really do not have logics only if you have if you are good with the current affairs if you have prepared the last 12 months or one uh, one and a half year current affairs and specifically you have you have tried to memorize some of the most important species which were in use frequently then only you can solve these kind of questions for example you think of olive ridley how many times we read about olive ridley no olive ridley there are and, and please remember all these species are so important you may have a stand alone question coming on the species as well so olive ridley turtles they are the second smallest and most abundant sea turtles globally in many 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 documents or books they it's it's given i have read it somewhere that they are mentioned to be smallest but please remember it's a very important point they are second smallest and most abundant sea turtles globally so do you know which are the smallest turtles in the world if you know that please let me know in the comment section box let's see how many of you get this correct now olive ridley we all know they they come to india for their mass nesting every year they come to gahir math beach that is in odisha and it is the most significant breeding ground of these turtles and when these turtles come there in mass for the mass nestings uh, even the government closes that part of the beach so that nobody disturbs them in during the process of mass nesting there is a special name also given to the mass nesting by the olive ridley turtles and that is called the ari badas you may have a question on that what is ari badas that is nothing but a synchronized mass nestings where thousands of the female come together on the same beach and they lay their eggs that's called ari bada now this is a very typical feature associated with the olive ridley turtle coming to the iucn status guys they are vulnerable they are not critically endangered they are well taken care by a lot of uh, countries uh, including india so they are vulnerable not into the critically endangered so far they are found and why see this apply this logic since since they are most abundant sea turtles globally means you have significant number present so how can they, they can be critically endangered you can find them in warm water tropical water you can find them in pacific indian even in uh, atlantic so obviously their presence is so far you can't make them uh, in the category of critically vulnerable in fact you think of ghadials now how many ghadials we see today it's a very less percentage that used to be there initially ghadials are actually critically endangered once there was a time that ghadials used to be there in all the major river systems of indian subcontinent but today they are extinct in indus river today they are not present in brahmaputra uh, of bhutan they are not present in the iravadi river in fact they are present only just 2% of their former range so their their habitat has shrunk drastically so that make every possible sense you remember ghadial which is a fish eating crocodile with a very particular snout that you must have seen that particular big snout uh, crocodile is called the ghadial and they are critically endangered and then you have the alpine ibex that you can see in the picture this iucn status is least concerned they are also called as tin bok remember the alternative names also sometimes they are important and they are astonishing rock climbers i'm i'm sure you must have seen if you have seen any of the himalayan uh, ecosystem videos you must have seen the ibex uh, alpine ibex very beautifully climbing those very steep uh, uh, slopes of the himalayas they are perfect climbers in that in that particular case and uh, you must it's, it's a species of the goat that live in the alps of the europe and even in in himalayas you have very similar kind of the ibexes uh, which are present so they are least concerned 
Now, if you if you go back to the question, you can clearly uh, uh, you can figure out which what's the problem. Olive Ridleys are they are vulnerable. Ghadiyals are critically endangered. In my opinion, if you have this kind of status, IUCN status, make sure you never ever select all three kind of thing. No, because in my opinion, in my experience, UPSC definitely going to trick you somewhere. At least if even if there is one wrong. there will always be something wrong with the iucn and that is the purpose of the upsc so about this question i would say it was a tough question why because you don't have a guess work how would you, how will you do a guess work you can't do that with little bit logic you can take a risk because see uh, at least these two are very much in news and since they are very much in news that is why you can you are supposed to be uh, you know remembering these iucn status because these are not the species which are very difficult to remember they are very common species that's why i'm saying you should have in my opinion you should have been able to attempt it or at least risk it because the species mentioned here are actually very very common one how many pair are correctly only one the third one is correct the first and second are incorrect okay moving on to the next question number 64 now here <coughs> your common sense will play a very important role how many statements the two statements are given okay forget about the details it says bangladesh is the third largest export destination for indian goods after the us do you, do you really think so i mean if that would have been the case i'm sure we, we we must have read somewhere somewhere we must have read because if we know that bangladesh has is actually growing uh, as a country it is well known for its export potentials but it's not that it has become the third largest export destination we have other destinations also uh, and clearly the bangladesh recently become a better economic country uh, as compared to pakistan they have overtaken the pakistan in terms of the gdp but they are not still the third one i don't know let's say i don't know what rank they are but clearly they are not at rank 3 that much i i can assure if i have figured out this much that okay first look not correct then only one option is there that is d because d is the only option d is the only option which says one is incorrect so my option is going to be d that with the question was a medium one but could have been attempted with the common sense okay you got my point now please get into the details of the question why this question is important because recently bangladesh replaced pakistan as the second largest economy of south asian region yes after india it is bangladesh who is the second largest economy as per the world bank data the gdp of bangladesh is somewhere 460 billion dollars whereas in pakistan was just 375 and shrinking down so bangladesh right now is the fifth largest export destination for indian goods not the third one but the fifth one which is still very good so after us uae uh, netherland and china so this is the correct order So India's largest export destination is still US. Then it is UAE, Netherlands, and China. And then fifth one is Bangladesh. Bangladesh accounts for overall 2.7 percent of all Indian exports. That goes to Bangladesh. So my my point is, I really do not have to be champion of numbers with this. This question could have been solved with a pure logic, with a pure guesswork. you know for even for the guess work you need to have some logic so that makes this question quite attemptable not something which is difficult so medium question but could have been attempted easily answer is supposed to be d so sometimes that way also that ways this kind of elimination this kind of smart techniques can help you out to actually figure out which statement is correct which is not correct question 65 is with respect to with reference to the x ray polarization now very important question what is x ray polarization you need to know about the electromagnetic radiations you need to know the spectrum for that purpose and please remember my one tip whenever the question is with respect to the electromagnetic spectrum any ray gamma ray x ray uh, visible ray uv ray ir whatever always be careful about this part frequencies energies wavelength there are 99% chances UPSC is going to switch that part for you for sure now here for example in this particular case if you see the question is about the x rays okay 
Now, X-ray, what is an X-ray? Look at the spectrum. You have the whole spectrum right from the radio waves to the micro to the infra to the visible UV, X-ray and the gamma rays. Okay. Now, X-rays in the form of electromagnetic radiation, they have high energy and they have high frequency. The more you are going, look at the, look at the way. This is a less frequency. You can see there is a huge gap between the two waves. So, this is the least frequency and that gamma is going to be having the highest frequency. Make sure, uh, make sense. And if you look, because it's a very obvious kind, if the frequency is more, the wavelength is going to be short. What is the wavelength? Wavelength is wavelength is the is the is the distance between the two crest or the two, uh, uh, you know, lower parts. So trough. So either the difference between the two crest or the two uh, uh, trough that is the, that is the wavelength. So obviously, if the frequencies are less, if the two waves are very close to each other, wavelength is supposed to be short. Frequency is always inversely proportional to the wavelength or the vice versa. You can think of right. So here clearly, I am if I am having something as high energy or and high energy always give you high frequency. So more you are going towards X-ray, gamma rays this way, always the energy is going to be high, the frequency going to be high, but the wavelength is going to be less, shorter than the visible light. Visible light consider it as a benchmark. So left side of the visible light, you have the RMI. Radio, micro, infra, RMI. On the right side of the visible, you have the UXG, the UV rays, the X rays, and the gamma rays. So divide the whole spectrum in this particular band. Understood this point, guys? Okay. Now, what's the problem with the first statement? First, let's figure figure that out. Now, here you you have learned that okay, X ray is towards the right side of the visible light, so wavelength has to be short. Frequency and energy should be high. This much you can figure out. Now look at the X-ray. Here it says high energy, okay. Less frequency, no. If the energy is high, frequency has to be high. What about the wavelength? Wavelength always going to be short because if it's high frequency, you have less distance between the waves. Very common. If this is a common sense if you have basic understanding of the science and if you have read the physics, if you have read this whole phenomena at least once in your school time, you can figure out the problem. So this clearly is not right in this particular case. Now what about the other statements? Then we figure out the other statements as well. Now guys, um, as per the question says, remember this one important thing. As the X-ray light, whenever it passes through any material, the electric part of the electromagnetic waves always causes electrons to emit a photon. Photon is a light particle. It is the emission of the photon that gives the appearance that the original photon has changed the direction or has been scattered. This is just an appearance because every time the X-ray is going to pass a material, there is going to be emission of the photons. And that's why it has this has this has the appearance of somehow of a scattering effect. Now, please remember. Now, recently the, this question was with respect to the X-ray polarization. Okay. Now for the first time, X-ray polarization is going to measure the medium energy band that we have. And X-ray polarization actually relates to India's first dedicated polymetry mission. And the name of the mission is ExpoSat. Please remember this name. I am going to give it a three star because I expect question coming on the ExpoSat. What is ExpoSat? It's India's first dedicated polymetry mission that is going to measure the medium energy bands and it relates to the X-ray polarization. Is it difficult to remember? No, sir. It's easy to remember. The question was a confusing one. Why? Question says, it is the astrosat that relates to X-ray polarization. No. Astrosat is altogether a different thing. So don't get confused between astrosat and exposat very very uh, close uh, kind of uh, uh, you know the two words but they are not same astrosat is india's first dedicated space observatory number one exposat is first dedicated polymetry uh, mission two things are different astrosat job is to study the celestial sources in x-ray optical and uv spectrums exposat is about the X-ray polarization. 
ExpoSat is going to observe two kind of sources, the persistent and the transient sources that we have. I hope this much distinction is clear. If you go to the question right now, then you can easily figure out the first statement being wrong, I have already explained. The third is wrong. It says AstroSat is about the polymetry, no sir. For that, we have the Expo Sat. We just have figured out. The second is correct here, the emission of the photon. Was this question easy? Not at all. This was a tough question. It was a typical question. Uh, can I attempt it without any problem? Of course, you can't attempt with little bit knowledge. You have to be specific with this. It's a very difficult question. Can I take a risk? You can take a risk if you are in a position to at least figure out the two statements you are confident about. Otherwise, you need to skip this kind of question because it's a typical question. It's a tough question. The guesswork is not going to be easy in these kind of questions. Next, question 66 is with respect to the crime and criminal tracking network and system called the CT, CCTNS. It's a very important one. Before I get on to the details of the CCTNS, you need to have a background why this was created. For that purpose, you need to go back to the times, unfortunate 2008 Mumbai attacks. After that horrific incident of Mumbai attacks 2008, the then Home, uh, Home Minister proposed this concept of CCTNS. Uh, this concept was floated way back in 2008 only. And this is based on common integrated police application called SIPA. And then the Nodal Ministry of Home Affairs has been carrying out this mission mode project since 2009 under the National E-Governance Plan. That is the background. Finally, finally, we have got the CCTNS that has been expanded to incorporate the police data. And right now, it has, other than police data, it has the elements of criminal justice. It, has, it, it includes the court, prison, prosecution, forensic, fingerprint, all kind of data is is within that CCTNS, right? This is important, guys. Now, if you look at the question, this the first statement says, the CCTNS aims to integrate all criminal data. Yes, sir. It wants to integrate. That is the whole purpose. The integration of all the criminal data and all the criminal records in India into this one core application software within the CCTNS. When it comes to the implementation of this, it is the National Crime Record Bureau because NCRB already has a data on majority of the things. So the best possible implementing agency is going to be an NCRB because they are the one having all the crime data and records. Also, the CCTNS project includes two types of connectivity. This in offers a horizontal connectivity, means connecting the police functions at state and central level and the vertical connectivity means connecting the police units, linking the police units at various levels within the state. For example, the linking of the functioning of the police station to, to the district police office, to the state headquarters and so far, so far. This vertical integration or vertical connectivity is always going to be within the state, within police and within the same state. But when it comes to horizontal, it's about connecting the state activities to the central activities. In general also, always remember this horizontal vertical. It's a very common expression of making you understand the interlinking of the two hierarchies. Now, if you go back to the question, sir, you know which, which problem is there. The problem is with this. What's the nodal agency? It's not the ICJS. It's not this one. It is, all, uh, it is the NCRB. So the statement number two is wrong, but the first one and the third one are correct. How I should approach this question? If you look at the question, guys, the first statement, this makes some sense. Okay, because the, the question, the, the full form says a lot. Crime and criminal tracking. How would you track? How would you track a crime? How would you track a criminal? For that purpose, you need to have all the criminal data and records. That makes every sense. I can blindly say it's true. It is correct. Second is a tricky one. It's a fact-based question. I can't really guess about it. But third, again, I can guess. Forget about this. If, if the question says horizontal, my common sense let me know, okay, horizontal connectivity is always going to be between center and state. I can still rely on that. Question was a tough one. Can I attempt it? Yes, I can at least risk it. I can risk because I have figured out with logic that two things are going to be correct. Then it is your call whether you want to skip or you want to risk depending on, on that if you have the space of taking a risk. 
because second is purely fact based it this question is a good uh, merger of the concept and the fact so here in this case how many are correct only two are correct second being not correct i hope you have understood the approach if you liking the video let me know in the comment section box as well then the question number 67 it says be careful the question says which is not correct not correct the question takes you back to the art and culture uh, the question is about the srimanta sankara dev how much you know about the person first learn that point okay and then we'll come back to the question so talking about the srimanta sankara dev uh, he was born in assam and um, srimanta sankara dev is very well known as a vaishnavite reformer so he believed in vaishnavism he used to worship vishnu right and uh, definitely he has he has left an indelible mark on the cultural and religious landscape especially that of assam he has contributed a lot a lot in that particular way why and how srimanta sankara dev he was a reno, renowned saint scholar poet playwright dancer actor musician artist look at the look at the look at the checklist and he played a pivotal role as a social religious reformer also reshaping the assamese society through his teachings and artistic endeavors i mean where you can't find this kind of talent in present world right now talking about srimanta sankara dev his teaching mainly focused on prayers and chanting instead of idol worship so he 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 was not into the idol worship he was more into the prayers and the chanting in fact sankara dev is is the one person who is considered that has inspired the bhakti bhakti movement in the assam because already in india there was a bhakti movement going on but in particular assam it was him that has inspired and for that purpose for inspiring that bhakti movement he advocated a very famous slogan ek dev ek seva ek binay nahi keva that means one should worship none but only one god and that is lord krishna lord krishna is you know it's a it's a incarnation of lord vishnu uh, only right so he was very much into vishnu uh, uh, cult vishnu following when it comes to the uh, the kind of work that he has done so sankara dev is credited with building a past cultural relics and devising new forms of music he also uh, developed a new form of theoretical performances new form of dance satriya satriya is a very famous dance it's, a, it's one of the classical dance in assam so satriya dance is the one created by him only literary languages the brajwali is the one that is created by sankara dev music the bor geet bor geet is a music of assam created by him only the theatrical performance called the An uh, ankiya nat or the bhavana both these are very famous even today in assam so they are also credited to this one person right and not just this he created this classical dance form which i mentioned as uh, as uh, the sankari dance and the satriya not just satriya in fact he is also credited with the sankari dance and you know that uh, sangeet natak academy recognized the satariya as a classical dance form way back in 2000 how many classical dances do we have tell me do you know the number tell me how many classical dance forms we have classified by the sangeet natak academy if you know the answer i would love to see that in the comment section below now if you go back to the question this was a very tough question not at all easy not at all easy the question which is not correct sir first statement is not correct because you have just learned the sankara dev is don't get confused the name the name is sankar but he was not into shaivism the name is sankar but he was into the vaishnavism understood he was not a follower of shiv he was a follower of lord vishnu so first statement is wrong other three are correct the question not correct only one was it tough one absolutely tough one very hard core fact based topic very hard core what to do you can take a risk if you have if you have read about somewhere otherwise you need to skip because not easy to decode this kind of question heavily based on the facts the next question is again the match the following but look at the three options great beer lake lake huron lake victoria aren't they aren't all the three are very very famous lakes and i can i can bet everyone knows in to to like with which country they are associated with 
So if you look at the options, all three seems incorrect. Where is the great beer lake guys? It is in Canada. We, we know it's a very famous lake that we have in Canada. You can see this is the great beer lake. Similarly, the next question is about the lake uh, Huron. Lake Huron is also in Canada. In fact, Lake Huron is the one which is shared. It's a part of the five great lakes that we have. You have the Lake Superior, Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, Lake Erie, Lake Ontario. These are the five called the five great lakes uh, which are, which are uh, making a natural boundary between uh, Canada and USA. Please remember one thing. The Lake Michigan, this is the only lake which is only and only lying in US, not, not shared by the Canada. Otherwise, all the four, the Superior, the Huron, the Erie, the Ontario, or four are shared between the Canada and the USA. Lake Huron is also to be remembered as the world's third largest freshwater lake after Lake Superior, which is just here, and Lake Victoria, which is our next question. So it's the third fresh largest freshwater lakes that we have. So where is this Lake Victoria? The next question. For that purpose, you have to go to Africa. Not America, not at all. Lake Victoria is in Africa. In fact, it is Africa's largest lake by area, world's largest tropical lake, world's second largest freshwater lake after Lake Superior. That is all important facts that you need to remember. In fact, Lake Victoria, you can see here, it is shared by three countries. It is shared by Tanzania, Kenya and Uganda, very important fact you need to remember. In fact, Lake Victoria is a source of White Nile that you need to remember. Because this is the source of White Nile from Ethiopian highlands, the Blue Nile also comes out, the two merges together and then you get the, the main Nile river, the lifeline of Egypt. So all these facts are absolutely important. One additional thing I would like to tell you. So if you can see, this is Lake Tanganyika, below is Lake uh, Nyasa. These are the part of Eastern Rift Valley. Please remember, Lake Victoria is not a part of Great Rift Valley. It is not a part of the Great Eastern African Rift Valley. It is not a part. It is not created as a part of Rift, as Lake Tanganyika or Lake Malawi or Nyasa, whatever you like to call it. Okay, remember that. Now if you go back to the question, sir. Very easy question because these are all three are very, very famous, uh, uh, you know, all three are very, very famous lakes. So here, which is correctly, sir, none. All three are wrong. You have just learnt with me. Easy question should have been attempted because I expect you guys, at least you know about these important lakes. If you have not prepared so far, I recommend you to please go and check out all the important lakes, at least one, at least read them once, that's really important. Next question is with respect to the Pench Tiger Reserve, one of the most important famous tiger reserves that we have. First statement says the reserve has marked as India's first dark sky park. Yes, this is true. This is something we have read in the news very commonly. Is it fifth such in park, park in Asia? I don't know. But I can still, okay, I can think, okay, let's see. It's the, it's the correct one because that much intuition you have to make at work. Problem is, very obvious problem that I can figure out with the statement number 2. The Pench Tiger Reserve, it says it spread across Maharashtra and Chhattisgarh. Look at the map of India. Look at the map. Is Maharashtra directly sharing any border with Chhattisgarh? No sir. In between you have Madhya Pradesh. How can, how can one national park is spread at two far locations? It, it's can't, it can't be done. So it is actually spread across Maharashtra and not Chhattisgarh. Chhattisgarh is quite far away. In between you have the Madhya Pradesh. So this is a logical problem I can see, I can figure out. So for sure, I am damn sure this is going to be incorrect. Make sense? Now many of the tiger reserves or national parks, they get their name for, uh, uh, because of the river of the same name flowing in that area. Apply that logic. River Pench flows north to south. In the tiger reserve, splitting it in two equal parts? Yes, very obvious, very obvious. So first one is correct, third is correct, second is not correct. How many of the correct? Only two, sir. Do I need any special knowledge of that? No, not at all. I can solve it. What is a dark sky reserve or dark sky park? I'll explain it later. This, this is a, with one fact that we know, okay, fine. But look at the other way of solving it. 
The question was a medium one, but could have been attempted with the common sense? Yes, sir, could have been attempted. Now, getting on to the dark sky thing. What exactly is a dark sky? Please understand. A dark sky park, it's an area that restrict the artificial light pollution. Because, because light pollution is actually a big problem, especially when it comes to observing the night sky, which is best case for the astronomy and you know for all a lot of other things. So Pench Tiger Reserve, it is in Maharashtra, has been marked as India's first dark sky park and fifth such in the Asia. Now this fact from today onwards, try to remember this fact as a core fact. And like I told you, the spread is across MP and Maharashtra because Maharashtra Chhattisgarh don't share the boundary. Makes sense, right? Okay. So that brings us to the next question, which is question number 70. Talks about the Aadhaar payment bridge system. Okay. Let's say you have this question, Aadhaar payment bridge system. How to figure out? Let's say you have not read. Can I do some logical? I can do some logical work. I'm okay. The name, read the name again and again. Sometimes reading this name itself makes you understand the question. Aadhaar payment bridge system. Okay, I am going to do some payment using the Aadhaar. Keep that in, into mind. When it comes to Aadhaar, is it about any blockchain technology involved? No, not at all. Is it going to be any microfinance services? Doesn't make any sense. Now, only thing is to can be cross-border financial transactions, but in cross-border, uh, logical, in cross-border, how and why am I going to have a Aadhaar payment system? Not at all. So logically, very logically, I have only one choice. That is this, enabling direct benefit transfer using biometric authentication. Yes, sir, this is what we have read so far. Aadhaar is used as a DBT, the direct benefit transfer. I have not read about it, but I, I, I can still figure out from a common logical perspective. Question was a medium one, but could have been attempted without any excuse. You just need not to panic and try to be the smartest version of yourself and try to decode the question by reading it again, again and again helps you with a lot of things. Okay, important thing guys. Now I'll tell you the details. Talking about the ABPS, which is Aadhaar Payment Bridge System, it's a digital platform. Number one thing you have to remember. Implemented by National Payment Corporation of India, whenever there is any payment kind of platform involved, there is only one clearing house, one nodal agency in India, that is NPCI, National Payment Corporation of India, always going to be there. Now, in case of ABPS, this digital platform implemented by NPCI along with the UIDAI. Now, this ABPS act on the principle a person's Aadhaar number also becomes their financial address. Based on this principle, the whole payment network is created with uh, that is based on Aadhaar itself. Understood? This act as a bridge. Why it is called a bridge system? It, it act as a bridge. Bridge between what? Between the government department, bank and the beneficiary. And something that bridges the government and the beneficiary, that's why, that's why there is a DBT, direct benefit transfer. Where, where the government can transfer the subsidies or any benefit to the beneficiary directly into the bank account. That's why the name is bridge. That justifies the answer. So I hope that makes sense to everyone, right? Okay. Brings us to the next question, which is question 71. Talking about Indian STEM. Now this question is very, I would say it was a, it was a tough question. Not easy to understand or in easy to uh, attempt it. How and why? Let's understand. So why it is in news recently? Let me tell you. Government of India has recently proposed that they are going to repeal the Indian STEM Act of 1899. A way long, very old act that we are still following. The government says we are going to repeal it. And now we are going to bring a new law which is going to be Indian STEM Bill 2023 for the STEM duty in the country. Remember this one part. Okay, fine. Now, under this new proposal, there is a provision of the e-stamping. What is an e-stamp? Now, it talks about digital e-stamping. E-stamp or electronic stamp means electronically generated impression 
denoting the payment of the stamp duty by electronic means or otherwise. I think this is a very obvious explanation. Normal stamp duty or the stamp you know, e stamp is going to be electronic version of that. That's it, right? That is important. Also, when it comes to stamp duty, and you must have must have read about the stamp duty. It it is essentially a government tax. So you must have bought that those small small stamps, not a two rupee stamp, five rupee stamp. So any government document is going to be attested. Or going to have that stamp on that stamp duty. So we we used to in in our childhood days we used to collect a lot of stamps if you remember. So stamp duty is a government tax. If you are purchasing a five rupee stamp, that that money goes directly to the government as a tax. So stamp duty is levied to the to register document. If you have to, and it's it's a pakka document. A sarkari document becomes a pakka document only when it has some stamp duty on that. That makes the it makes it a sarkari paper, government paper. So if you have to like you know let's say there, there, there you have to sign an agreement or there is some sign of uh, sign, sign of uh, transaction paper between two parties with the, uh, with the registrar so for to register that kind of document the stamp duty is mandatory essential please remember stamp duty is accepted as a valid evidence in the court of law it's a it's a government tax that people have paid so if there is any dispute and if somebody gives you the proof that see sir that person has signed on this paper with the stamp duty it is a valid evidence in the court of law how they are levied and collected stamp duties are always going to be levied by the central government it's a very important fact to maintain the uniformity but within the states are collected and appropriated by the concerned states this is this is a provision that we have as per the article 268 so very important levied by central government collected appropriated by the state governments so if you go back to the question do you have do you see any problem here yes sir we see first problem is statement number 3 it is not accepted as a valid evidence obviously every government text is going to be admitted as a valid evidence how can it be an exception make no sense stamp duties are they levied by state government no they are it's it's a interchange they are they are levied by center and appropriated by states so third and fourth are incorrect first very logical explanation what electronic stamp can be if you simply look at the definition make every sense it's government tax yes sir so first and second are very easy very very easy even third is very easy maybe maybe you people have found this one little bit challenging because because you know it's, it's bit confusing there are so many taxes some taxes are levied by center levied by states some are collected by this or that way so yes this part fourth part i i agree maybe little tricky but at least the first three are not problematic at all and if you have figured out the first three you know the question being tough you can still take a risk because at least you have figured out three out of four what else do you want what else do you want right so first correct second correct third incorrect fourth incorrect answer is supposed to be how many correct only to b has to be the right answer that brings us to the next question that is question number 72 straight forward question operation amrit any guess work amrit amrit you know the amrit whosoever tastes the amrit becomes immortal that's as per the stories but this amrit can be anything it could be a evacuation mission could be about healthcare could be about antibiotics now in this question i do not really think the guess work is going to work what is amrit let me tell you it's a a amrit is actually it's a it's an operation amrit started by the kerala government kerala government started it to actually check the over the counter sales of the antibiotics the over use of antibiotics and to counter the anti uh, microbial resistance in the state this is a state government initiative taken care by kerala government okay this question was a tough one fact based no scope of guess work in case you are not sure in case you have not read better to skip because even you you are not in a position to eliminate any options you don't you are not in a position to take any risk in the statement because it's straight forward with very less scope of elimination so let me give you little detail in case the question comes in your exam 
Operation Amrit is launched by Kerala government to prevent the overuse of antibiotics, detect the over-the-counter sales antibiotics by conducting surprise raids in retail medical shops so that nobody is, is uh, you know, overselling the antibiotics. Only when it is required, it needs to be given. That's it. And for that purpose, not Kerala, this is not just the one, it's one of the uh, initiatives. Kerala government has actually taken a lot of steps to prevent the antibiotic overuse and I really wish the whole of the Indian states must have must have taken the matter so seriously. India's first state is Kerala. They have developed the whole AMR action plan in 2018. You may have this question also guys. Why not? You may have this question. Which of the following Indian state as the first to have a AMR action plan? That needs to be Kerala. Also, this Kerala is the first state in India. They have also established a block level AMR committee in the blocks in 2023. For surveillance purpose, surveillance of the antibiotic use in the state, Kerala Antimicrobial Resistance Surveillance Network is there. For proper disposal of unused antibiotics, Kerala government has developed program on removal of unused drugs as well, which is called the PROUD. You may have a question on PROUD as well. What is PROUD initiative by which government? So lots and lots of things. And let me tell you, let me uh, tell you, do prepare yourself to have a question on antibiotics and antimicrobial resistance. I would say it's a four star kind of topic. You will be having something related to that. It's very obvious. Question number 73. Now the three statements are given and you are supposed to you know, find out about which national park I'm talking about. Okay, sir. The question has a very important hint. The, question, the first statement says, it's the second Ramsar site of Odisha. The keyword is Odisha. So we know that in the Chilka Lake of Odisha is one of the Ramsar site. So my question, the first statement itself helps me out that any of the option is going to be the one that actually is in Odisha. So for example, I the, uh, the question cannot have D, B as the option because the Chingam is in Jammu Kashmir. I can eliminate. Orang is in Assam. Cannot be, cannot be my right answer. So because, because that clearly says it has to be within Odisha. Simli Pal and Bhitar Karnika can be the two choices. So at least 50-50 chance I have achieved. I have eliminated the possible wrong ones. Then it says it hosts many mangrove species and second largest mangrove ecosystem in the country. If you, if you have little bit knowledge about the locations of Simli Pal and Bhitar Karnika, Bhitar Karnika National Park actually includes the Gahirmat Beach. So it is more towards the coastline. It is more a coastal ecosystem. And that makes sense why you are going to have mangrove species because mangroves relate to the coastal areas. Make sense? So answer is supposed to be and it is going to be D for sure. Simli Pal is little into inward side, not at the coastal location. And yes, Bhitar Karnika has many rivers, the Brahmani River, Baitarni River, Damra River. So answer is D. With my utmost logic, I can figure it out. The question was a medium one, but could have been attempted by using little bit of geographical knowledge, by using little bit of my uh, other knowledge, I could have attempted it very easily. Answer, Bhitar Karnika National Park. Very important park. Gahirmat Marine Century, you have just read that the olive ridley turtles, they come to Gahirmat. Remember that also. Very, very important, guys. Question 74 is about the child labor. Okay, fine, fair enough. First statement, look at the first statement. I'll get to the details. Look at the first statement. It says, the as per the ILO estimates, the incidence of child labor in India has increased by so and so number. I am not interested in the number. Number does not matter to me. The trends matter a lot in the UPSC. The, the numbers are not to be cramped. No, they're not asking you the number. They, are, they want to check if you are aware with the trend or not. You should be aware if the child labor is increasing in India or child labor is decreasing in India. So we, we know the child labor is decreasing. The child labor is not increasing in India. So clearly my first statement is wrong because child labor in India has actually decreased, not increased. So that makes sense why my first statement needs to be wrong. I'm aware with the trend. I'm not worried about the number. Like by how much it, it decreased does not matter. At least I know it, it has decreased. Look at the statement. I have eliminated the other options. 
by just knowing that trend, I have got my answer. My answer is supposed to be C without even reading. So yes, the second and the third statements are correct because we know the third statement as well. We have read about the Juvenile Justice Act n number of times, which clearly defines who is a child. Child as per Juvenile Justice Act is any person not yet completed 18 years of age. So less than 18 years of the age is considered to be juvenile as uh, uh, is considered to be child as per the JJ Act 2015. So yes, it's correct. Article 45 says early childhood care education below the age of six years. Yes, sir. It is one of the DPSP directive principles of the state policies that we have. But what I'm trying to say, sometimes a smart work, smart elimination could have solved your thing. Question was a medium one, but we could have attempted even just by knowing which trend I need to remember. So child labor, yes, it has actually decreased in India, guys. Though in India, we still have lot of lots and lots of child labor is still prevalent. According to the ILO estimates, child labor, there are around 10 million working children between 5 to 14 years of age in India, unfortunately, out of which approximately uh, more than half we have boys and then approximately half we have the girls. But overall, the problem of child labor has decreased by 2.6 million. And I'm really wishing when the new Sensex comes that the trend must have continued and things have really got better for the child labor thing, right? When it comes to the child upliftment in our constitution, there are so many provisions that I can have a separate MCQ coming on that as well. If question says which of the following are the provisions for the child upliftment or in which of the following articles there are provision of child upliftment. For example, Article 21A that gives the right to education talks about the free compulsory education to the child between 16 to 40, uh, 14 years of age. Article 23 dedicatedly talks about the prohibition of trafficking in human beings and forced labor. Article 24 very clearly mentioned the word prohibition of employment of the children in factories and mines. Specified the guidelines. Article 39, the DPSP. That also talks about uh, the child labor and child upliftment and 45 clearly says early childhood care and education of the children below the age of 6 needs to be taken care of. Make sense guys? Very important. Okay. Now that brings us to the question number 75. Again be careful. Question is about the poverty. Okay fine. Now look at the two statements. The first statement talks about a comparison about the absolute poverty and the relative poverty. If you simply look at the um, you know English perspective of this topic, if you simply look from the English perspective, what is absolute poverty? Where there is absolute you know deprivation of something. Relative is not. It's not necessary. I don't have it at all. Maybe I'm having less as compared to the others. I don't have any food yet at my home. That's absolute poverty. I have less food comparable to that person. Relative poverty. Make, make some sense? Okay. So if you look at the statement, absolute poverty, when someone lacks the resources to survive, yes, makes sense. Where relative, when someone's income is too low to participate in society. Very logical comparison and statements, which I can agree upon. And I know when it comes to estimating poverty, it is the Niti Aayog in India that estimate the poverty using the National Statistical Survey Organization data, NSSO data. Both statements are correct. But tell me, do you see any relation between the two? Do you see any relation? Both are correct, but I don't see any connection. How statement two explains statement one? No. By estimating poverty, I'm not going to differentiate between absolute and relative. I don't see any connection between the two. Op uh, the answer has to be B. Both are correct. But two is not the explanation of the one. Two are standalone statements and standalone in their own domain. So the question was very easy because the statements are not difficult. And you could have attempted by very, very common sense of this question. Just to give you a little bit more knowledge about the absolute and relative poverty, 
you can you must see this particular table guys it's a comparative table of the absolute and relative poverty where as by the definition absolute poverty means lack of basic necessity where relative means income or resource inadequacy compared to the societal standards when it comes to the measurement absolute poverty is very specific income threshold if somebody is having or earning less than 2.15 dollar per day per capita this is as per world bank uh, estimate that is considered to be absolute poverty whereas relative is comparative to the average of the medium income of the society where absolute focus essentially for survival and subsistence a relative talks about the disparities and social inequalities make some sense so this comparison is very important guys very very important okay okay and yes when it comes to the estimates niti ayog is uh, the one is the nodal agency that actually estimates the poverty every 5 years the nsso conducts a survey to collect the household consumption expenditure based on that we calculate uh this particular thing this is absolutely important and poverty line estimates we make to understand the level of uh, poverty in india please remember one more thing i mean this is this can be another question altogether when it comes to the bpl census below poverty line census it is the ministry of rural development that actually conduct that uh, you know that census so make sure you may have the mcq kind of thing coming from this information as well now the next question 76 talks about the award very famous awards the uh, the padam bhushan the padam shri the padam uh, uh, vibhushan awards very interesting question very very important i am talking about the padma awards why it is in news because it's given almost every year and uh, we have so much so many things coming in the news with respect to the padma awards so you you are supposed to figure out which statements are correct okay fine let me let me take you to the, to the detail first we know the padma awards in india they are considered to be the highest civilian honors this is a very common proven thing that we know and we also know these awards they started in 1954 they are announced every year every year on occasion of republic day but there was a time when the awards had to had to be interrupted there was a brief interruption especially during the years of 1978 79 and from 93 to 97 because of some reasons the awards could not be announced so they started in 1954 but there are two occasions when there were interruption they were not announced please remember these awards does not amount to title you know because as per article article 18 the use of the titles is prohibited but when it comes to padma awards they are not they are not conf, they are not into conflict of that these awards are does not amount to title and cannot be used as a suffix or prefix to the award i mean if i tomorrow if i get an award if i uh, uh, get a uh, padam vibhushan or padam padam shri or padam uh, uh, bhushan i'm not going to name of myself as a padam bhushan ashish malik is not going to be my name forever it's my it's it's the honor that i've got it's the award i can't use it as a surname on my driving license or aadhar or her name plate i can't do that because as per article 18 it's it's prohibited only professional titles are allowed like doctor engineer only these are allowed not these kind of things please remember remember the government of india has two civilian awards one it used to have in 1954 there were only two civilian awards one was bharat ratna other other was the padam vibhushan later these padam vibhushans were actually they were classified into more better categories and they were given the name as padam vibhushan padam bhushan and padam shri their original name was something different then the initially their name was pehla varg dusra varg and tisra varg but that make no sense and and i'm really happy that they have changed to padam vibhushan padam bhushan and padam shri that is uh, after 1955 okay and of course there are some criteria who who will get the padam vibhushan for exceptional and distinguished services padam bhushan for again uh, distinguished services for a high order it's it's little bit lower in hierarchy and padam shri for any distinguished services of course the 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 hierarchy is in the dec decreasing order that is important and these are the three very prestigious uh, padma awards that you can see but who are eligible who can get these awards see when it comes to eligibility 
all persons without any distinction of race, occupation, position, sex, nothing. Everyone is eligible, but some exceptions. Even the government servants, the government, this is a very important point. Government servants, including those working in PSUs, are eligible, except, except doctors, scientists are not eligible for this allowance. Government servants are not eligible. Doctors and scientists can get it. But any government servant is not eligible for this award. The award normally not conferred posthumously. However, in, in some highly deserving cases, government can give it after the person is no more. But normally the Padam awards are given to the living person only. Not only, I, I, it would be wrong. I mean mostly. Understood? So, now if, if you go back to the question, you will see, sir, my, uh, the answer is supposed to be, uh, you just have to eliminate, try to eliminate. Look at the second statement. It says that there is no interruption happened yet. Of course, we have seen there is interruption. I mean, there are no awards that have not been interrupted in one way or the other. I mean, it's very difficult. It's some, something started way back 1954. Of course, there, there can be interrupt. This, this statement looks too rigid to me. If I try to eliminate that, okay, try eliminate number 2. Oh my God, I got my answer as number D. Just by common sense wise eliminating number 2, I've got my answer as 1, 3 and 4 as correct one. So yes, the question was a tough one. Could have been attempted or at least to, could have taken a risk. Because at least you have the option of elimination. And by eliminating, you can at least do something good out, good out here. That brings us to the next question, question number 77. The question is with respect to Niti Aayog's multidimensional poverty in India since 2005-2006. Very important question. Let's see how we are supposed to learn and know about this particular fact. First thing is first. It's the question as per the question. So right now, remember first thing is, who in India, uh, you know, prepare the multidimensional poverty in India? Who is preparing that? It is Niti Ayo. You may have a standalone question coming on that as well. As per the latest uh, report that we have got, India registered a significant decline in multidimensional poverty, which used to be 29% plus in 2013 14. Thankfully, it has got down as declined as 11.28% in 2020 23. So please remember this trend. You never know you have a question coming as a trend. Like the way we have on the child labor, you may have a question on the trend of the multidimensional poverty. State-wise, if you look, it is, the, it is Uttar Pradesh registered the largest decline in number of poor escaping the multidimensional poverty in the last nine years, followed by Bihar, MP, Rajasthan. Which state has got the la biggest, largest progress? It is the UP, number one. Now, if you look at the multidimensional poverty index, in Indian case, all 12 pa parameters have got a significant improvement. Let me tell you, there is also a multidimensional poverty uh, index at a global level. If, if the MPI is of global level, it has three dimensions with the 10 indicators. This is global one. In Indian case, this there are three same dimensions, but the parameters are not 10 the parameters are 12. That is the basic difference between Indian multidimensional poverty index and the global multidimensional poverty index. So yes, this is very important that you need to remember. The pace of decline in poverty headcount using exponential method was faster. Yes, sir. This is a technical point which, which we have got right. Now, please compare. I have just mentioned about the 12 and the 10 parameters. Look, the dimensions are same. This is, this is Indian uh, uh, version of this. This is the Indian version. So the three dimensions are the same. The health, the education and living standard. The three are same. Where is the difference? Within the health, we have added one more parameter called the maternal health, which is not here in this case. Similarly, in standard of living, there are only this one. But in Indian case, we have, we have specially added the bank account. So this is the basic. That's why Indian version has 12 and they have got the 10 one. At least you should be very comfortable with the two. You must be aware of the comparison of the two. 
if you go back to the question guys how you can eliminate certain things so first thing is first the question says Bihar has got the largest decline we have just understood it is UP we really wished it could have been Bihar but it is UP they have got the largest decline followed by Bihar MP and Rajasthan so first is not correct so you have to eliminate number one second is correct third is correct the fourth again is wrong because it says unlike the global MPI India's MPI has three equally weighted dimensions no sir these three are also the same the difference between global and Indian MPI is the indicator not dimension dimensions are same both ways in Indian case we have 12 indicators the global one has 10 that is the difference not the dimension wise so answer supposed to be two that is only two answers second and third being correct question was a tough one I understand I agree guys but it's not something that you could have not attempted because this multi-dimensional poverty is a very important topic very common topic I expect you to at least attempt it in case you are totally blank you have absolutely no idea then I it's better to skip rather than taking unnecessary risk because of course the question is challenging it's based on a lot of facts next question was a straightforward question you were supposed to figure out the species a medium sized tree grows up to 16 20 meter gray trunk superficial root system bind the soil limit the erosion used as soil reclamation for uh, on laterite soils which species I'm talking about it's not sal it's not mahogany not at all it's not vetiler but the answer is mahua very fact based question can I guess it no no guesswork allowed if you do not know it then please skip only take a risk if you have 50 60 70 percent surety because because how would you take a guess it's not possible to guess this kind of question so this question in my opinion was a tough one most of the people may may not be able to solve this question but since we're talking about mahua of course you need to know certain facts it's a medium sized tree medium size like 16 20 meter in height it is native not just India it is present in India Sri Lanka Nepal Myanmar of course different names for different different regions we have the best part is that its superficial root system bind the soil and limit the erosion that is one of the most important use of the mahua tree that we have and that's why it is used as uh, for the purpose of soil reclamation in the late right soils that's very important guys it has a lot of nutritional value as well it's a very good source of vitamin C and vitamin A and also <clears throat> it's an oil crop used can be used for biodiesel production as well so yes you need to prepare all these kind of facts for this next question is a tech based question very latest very important technology that was in news called the Riju Pau Pave technology how I remember this technology this PAVE, PAVE stands for pavement pavement sir yes sir road highways that's pavement if you go by that logic answer is pretty clear so this Reju, uh, uh, Reju PAVE it's not any algo crypto rhythmic algorithm it's not about producing electricity it's simply a high altitude bituminous roads constructed by it can sustain to sub zero temperature conditions because in India especially along the line of actual control our border road organization BRO is constructing lots of roads considering the vulnerability of the Chinese attack anytime we are constructing those high altitude bituminous roads which are permanent roads and we are using this technology called Reju Pave technology and recently it was very much in news for all the infrastructure we are creating along the LAC at the high altitude location so answer is supposed to be B was this question easy not but it was a medium one but I think you could have attempted why see the statement the options are quite different I mean if even if you have a little bit basic idea sometimes what happens the options are so you know very similar becomes difficult to segregate but in this particular case the options are so closely placed that uh, sorry they are they are so different that you can straight away eliminate the uh, the options which are very far from the reality 
So I think this question could have been attempted or at least could have been risked rather skipping it because you can you can you can apply that sense of pay and payment and something like that some some logic you need to figure out right guys this is important so talking about the uh, rejupay technology few things because i i honestly uh, think that it's a three star four star kind of important question may have you may see this question in the upcoming prelims it's a technology developed by csir and C uh, central road research institute high altitude bituminous road constructed by it can sustain sub zero temperature why because this technology's asphalt modifier is actually a bio oil based that actually lowers the heating requirement and also results in negligible heat loss and that's why even during the times of snowfall you can still have a permanent road it's a it's a very indigenous technology that we have developed and we are very proud of this technology brings us to the last question that is question number 80 talking about the salt water crocodiles very interesting question guys about the salt water crocodile which statement is correct you need to figure out right okay so talking about the salt water crocodiles the very first thing is these salt water crocodiles are the largest of all crocodiles first thing is this you need to remember and also they are the largest reptiles in the world we, we really do not pay attention sometimes but these salt water crocodiles are the largest reptiles and of course largest of all crocodiles other uh, varieties we have as magar we have the we have the ghadial out of all them these salt water crocodiles are the largest one number two where do you find it when it, it comes to distribution they are abundantly present in the areas like sundarbans bhitar kanika national park and andaman um, and, um, andaman nicobar islands there they are present but like like wherever you have a salt water habitat no wherever you have the mangrove swamp estuaries coastal areas there 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 are chances of the presence of these salt water crocodiles since they are they are abundantly uh, distributed that's why their iucn status is least concerned they're not they're, they're still are maintaining good numbers though we are protecting them under appendix one uh, in sites and uh, schedule one as per the WPA 1972 so they are important but they are still least concerned so if you go back to the question the first and the second statements are of no problem for you both are correct the only problem is third one are they critically endangered no sir they are not since they they belong to India and uh, at least you are expected to know about these kind of species so IUCN status again I am telling you you will definitely going to have at least one or two question coming with respect to IUCN status. So it's, it's always advisable to you guys that you better read about the IUCN status of those species which were in news for the last 12 months or so, so that these kind of things don't go, go wrong in your exam. So here, how many correct? Only two. Question was a question was a medium one question could have been risked because at least few things you know guys right or this can be attempted with little bit of knowledge and fact based thing so that is all from my side in this particular video i really have i really hope that you guys have enjoyed see you guys soon with the last part that is part number five till then best wishes from my side keep preparing for the upsc exam if you have any queries with respect to the exam do let us know in the comment section box I personally read all the comments. If there's any query, anything, you can reach out to us anytime, guys. This is Ashish Malik and best of wishes to you guys. All the best for exam. Keep preparing and just do your best. Take care. God bless you. Jai Hind.